music. Ladies and gentlemen, the Steel Post Band was formed in 1975. Easy. I know by that time, a lot of you were not born. I wasn't even born yet. You understand me? <laughs> yeah, man, you know. <laughs> Easy. So, today, let's take our time and listen to history. How it was formed, you know, what exactly happened, why the name still powers, you know, and all that. Let's go online and talk to the lead singer of Steel Post, David Hines. David, you most welcome to Asasi Radio, the voice of our land. 99.5 in Accra, 98.5 in Kumasi, 100.3 in Cape Coast, and 99.7 in the Northern Region, Tamale. We are the voice of the land, and we are nationwide. David, you're most welcome. All right, respect you all, as I would say, Aquaba. Aquaba. Crazy. You got that one right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, man, yeah, man. So, David, talk to me now. Talking about, um, in terms of yourself, I would like you to talk a bit about yourself and also the formation of the band Steel Pulse. Well, it's commonly known that, you know, um, we are from primarily descendants of Jamaicans who are descendants of Africans. So, you know, I was born in the mid-50s, mm -hmm. long before you. Yeah, yeah. And our parents, you know, in the United Kingdom, our parents migrated after World War II took place. And the band formulated itself in 1975 after experiencing music that was coming out of Jamaica. At that time, we had Blue Beat, Ska, Rocksteady, Calypso, you name it, and Reggae in its early form. To the one drop, as everybody know, know, knows it for today, you know, coming from cats like um, Alton Ellis, you know, Ken Boot, Bob Marlin of Wales, of course, Jimmy Cliff, Toots and the Maytals, and you name it. So we've evolved out of that experience, so to speak. Oh, all right. Easy. All right. So, in terms of the of you guys coming together as one to form the Steel Post, you know, band, you know, reading from the internet and you know watching the few interviews, the item granted and all that. Um, said you guys were inspired by, you know, Bob Marley and the Wayless Catch Fire album. How, how true is that? Can you confirm that? That's 100% true. Up until then, I mean, we've been listening to reggae music. Um, like I said, I mentioned certain artists like your John Holtz, your Ken Booths, your mm -hmm. Alton Ellis's, mm -hmm. um, you, you name it. That was the kind of music I was um, knocking around the sound systems in our community. Mm -hmm. However, when Bob Marley and the Wailers came with the Catch a Fire album, it made a lot of um, indentation in the music industry in a positive way. Mm -hmm. um, musically, it was a stand, a cut above the rest, and also a con to the album, the sleeve itself, the artwork that took place with that album, the whole packaging was another cut above the rest that was happening. Mm -hmm. within the industry at that time. So we were so impressed with the presentation of the album, both visually and and also the you know the sound of it, the lyrical content it had, the energy behind it, the sound of the voice, the whole packaging was like nothing. It was unprecedented. And that influenced us so much that we thought it was necessary to put that kind of a follow that kind of style of music in every sense of the word. Wow. Wow. Easy. So, now, that inspired, you know, young youths like yourself, you know, and your brothers that time to form the group Steel Pose. But I would like to know, why the name Steel Pose? Well, <laughs> it's something that, <laughs> funny enough, I mean, myself and Skelly's had this ongoing battle about Jamaicans um, hanging around um, betting offices, you know, mm -hmm. which is a bookies, what we call it in England, which Jamaicans 
generally speaking, have a tendency to um, populate, mm-hmm. one for a better phrase, you know, the betting stations when it comes to backing horses. Mm-hmm. And um, Steel Pulse actually derives from the name of a racehorse. Okay. So that's where the name came from. Steel Pulse was a winning racehorse of the Irish Derby in 1972. So that's where the name came from, a racehorse. All right. Easy. All right. We give thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, please, we live on the Sassit 995 Facebook page. Yeah. Please, share the link. Easy. Share the link. You can only get this exclusive on a sassy radio. You understand Easy. me? So share the link. <laughs> you see me? You, you think I play a thing? <laughs> No, no, Ram. no, no, sir. <laughs> so, tell me now, as a young youth growing up, you made um, mention of sound system, and I'm so much interested in that. Around that time, you know, growing up around the sound system, how, how was it like, you know, in the UK? At that time, we're talking about the early 70s, mm-hmm. and at that time, there was a lot of things happening politically, mm-hmm. racially, mm-hmm. and otherwise. Mm-hmm. Um, politically, as you know, um, blacks came to, you know, um, the United Kingdom from the British Caribbean standpoint because of World War II. We came over as um, manual workers, okay, working in train stations, hospitals, and factories. Along that came high employment because of the racial aspect. Also, racially, what was going on in a negative sense, there was not enough access to nightclubs mm-hmm. within the communities because they were mostly white-owned and there was that racism thing where there was always excuses for not having us being allowed into the nightclubs. Mm-hmm. So after a long while, you know, Jamaicans in, in particular started to formulate um, their own way of entertainment within their own homes. Mm-hmm. So the sound systems were built and people used to engage into parties in their own backyard or in their own houses. Mm-hmm. You know, in, in like in a room somewhere like that. Usually it's in the front room, the living room or back room of a house, so mm-hmm. to speak. And where the kitchen was used as the bar, you know, drinks were served, you know, um, cigarettes were sold, you know, and all that kind of activity took, took place. In in a sense, we decided to take on our own form of entertainment. And the sound system used to be the source of information in regards to um, the, the entertainment that we were having. So um, it was the latest form of information coming out of Jamaica. And that's how we sort of kept abreast and also kept in keeping with what was happening socially on the island was through sound systems. So that was that was the whole thing, entertainment and also something that was very much informative as far as what was going on with us politically throughout. All right, so I would like to find out whether, um, in terms of the sound system now, whether you had opportunity to be on the sound system to even sing or, 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 <laughs> or, 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 or any of those things before maybe the band was formed and all that. There was, uh, yeah, there were, I mean, we used to have, there was always a thing where there was a sound system that was within your community Mm -hmm. or within the street that you were living on Mm -hmm. or within the town, the district you were living in. And one would really be part of that sound system where you're carrying those heavy big boxes, the huge wardrobes, that kind of thing, or huge, they're like huge cabinets, so to speak, with a lot of speakers attached to them. So we'll be carrying them, and it was one way of helping yourself to get into, you know, a particular venue free of charge or because you're part of that movement. So it was almost like a, a musical gang, so to speak, where there was, a, you know, as much as 10 people following one particular sound system. Mm-hmm. And, and, and we became part of that kind of culture, listening to the latest form of music, going down to the music stores, getting the latest dub plate that was happening there and sort of bringing it back to your sound system. And it became a whole cultural experience musically. And we, we became part of that. Mm-hmm. And then when we started to formulate the band, 
it became a different situation altogether because the sound systems now were not really accepting British reggae music as part of their experience, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So it was like a, a battle, a clash of experiences where, you know, the sound systems were hard to win over mm -hmm. because they, they were the one that was setting the, the, the atmosphere within a venue, so to speak. And you had to be competing against the sound system because they had a lot more volume musically and they had a lot more different styles of reggae music. And this is what it was an ongoing battle for quite some time with sound systems and the people that were attending the sound system sessions not really gravitating towards the reggae music that was being born out of England by people like ourselves. Mm -hmm. And say Aswad and Matumbi that was around at the time and the Cimarons, which is another name that was quite popular and another band called The Undivided. Mm -hmm. So um, that's how it was. There was there was this closeness when we started to affiliate ourselves with them. But once we started to form ourselves as a group, then it became a separation because, you know, the non-acceptance of British reggae coming, you know, to, for the sound systems to gravitate and put out there with, along with the reggae music that, were, that was already coming out of Jamaica. So that was, a, that was one of the biggest problems and the biggest obstacles when we were formulating ourselves as a band within uh, the British system. All right. So, so now... Um, History has it that Jamaicans, you know, rejected reggae music coming from, you know, the UK those days. So I would like to find out from you, David, how, how, mm -hmm. did, how did the item were able to, you know, like maintain your grounds and you were able to sustain that particular pressure until now that you are, you are that, you know, big band that toured the world. Well, what absorbed a lot of the pressure was trying to be friendly with the sound systems where they gave you more of a respect. So instead of cutting you off after 10 minutes, they sort of um, prolonged your session. So if you were there to be on stage for one hour, in the past it used to be like, oh, you got 10 minutes. If you're not sounding good after 10 minutes, we're going to drown you out with our music. So you sort of, it was a way of befriending them initially, where you were allowed more time to perform. Then after a while now, we started to get um, popular, um, where the record labels were looking forward towards bands that were signing up to them. So we got recognized by going on tour with Burning Spear. Mm -hmm. That was our one of our first um, assignments, mm -hmm. where they started to... Um, take note of us for the fact that we were affiliated now with a, one of the biggest reggae bands that ever come out of Jamaica. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow. Easy. 29 gone into the R2 here on Asasi Radio, the voice of our land. And we're having one-on-one -on -one with David Hines, the lead singer of Steel Pulse. Easy. And trust me, we, we're listening to, you know, how... It was formed and the pressure they went through and through the passage of time, how they were able to sustain themselves up until now. Easy. Now, David, the album Babylon the Bandit won the Grammys, you know, um, in 1986. Now, I would like to find out, in recent time when, you know, Soldier won the 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 best you know reggae album at the Grammys, you know Jamaicans were fuming that yo, you know the man them don't deserve it man. I feel with thing and the man them the man them take it man and all that. How was it like, you know, in the eighties when the I them pick up, you know, the best reggae album? At that time, we're going back forty years ago almost. Mm -hmm. We're also going back to a time where reggae music was never a category in the industry to begin with. Mm -hmm. So it was a, one of the it was the second time there was a reggae nomination as such. If you see what I'm saying, mm -hmm. I mean the year before it was the first uh, reggae category mm -hmm. within the Grammy uh, formation. Definitely, you know, all the other genres of music existed. You had pop, you had um, rhythm and blues, you had blues. You had funk, you had all these, you know, R&B, 
jazz, all these formats were there, but reggae music was not one that was recognized at that time. So it was like a milestone when bands like ourselves won it to begin with. You know, you know, wow, the Grammys just formulated when it comes to the reggae category, and then bam, you know, Steel Pulse wins wins a Grammy. So it was like it was an historical milestone when it comes to both the band's career and also the genre of the music. Now, when you fast forward and start talking about bands like Soldier, the whole paradigm and the whole energy level has changed where, you know, um, reggae music now has a category for quite some time mm -hmm. within the industry itself. However, uh, what's been happening within the industry itself is that the music has been uh, more in the hands of white American bands performing that music more than, you know, it being internationally driven where bands like ourselves can participate. Mm -hmm. So um, what you got to recognize when it comes to the Grammy, the Grammy music is really based on a lot of music that is formed outside, not that that's formed inside of America, as opposed to outside of America. And one of the reasons why Steel Pulse won the Grammys 40 years ago, well, almost 40 years ago, was based on the fact that Steel Pulse has been visible within the American industry for quite some time to warrant us to be recognized within within the, the, the Grammy, um, the way they do things as far as um, recognizing who does what within the industry in the reggae category. So that's what that's one of the main things. So we should not lose sight of that. Okay. So Soldiers Now is a reggae band within the American industry mm -hmm. and White reggae has been taking the precedent within the industry for the past 10 years, if you see what I'm saying, mm -hmm. to the point where when it comes to festivals, you know, I'm saying it as it is, mm -hmm. you know, um, I'm calling a spade a spade. Definitely. I'm saying it as it is because what's happening within the industry right now, that over the past 10 years, at least, white reggae bands have been the, the, the forebears of the reggae music with, in regards to festivals, in regards to record sales, in regards to visibility, you know, in, in, in regards to that industry, the reggae industry in the United States. So it wasn't a surprise to bands like ourselves when um, Soldier won the reggae <laughs> nomination. We were saying to ourselves, what took so long because of the en energy level that's been happening in the United States in regards to white reggae getting that visibility over the past 10, 15 years. This is what I'm saying. So people outside of America now will not recognize bands like Soldier for that reason. Because outside of America, Soldier is not a recognized band nowhere. This is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. So I could understand the uproar. I can understand the animosity. I can understand the 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 the, the, the disgruntlement of the situation. Because outside of the United States, they're not recognized. But Let's face it, when it comes to Grammy winning activities, United States, that's where it originated from. So you got to expect that's the way it is. Easy. All right. So now from Babylon the Bandit, you know, from from that time, Steel Pulse has been, you know, nominated, you know, several times. Like, for example, the album Victims, 1991. You understand me? You know, yeah. back to um, Rastafari Sentinel in, in, in 1992, Rage and Fury 1998, Living Legacy 2000, and Mass mani um, Manipulation in 2019. All these albums were nominated, but the IDM couldn't pick it up again. Are you surprised? Um, There's a lot of things when it comes to the cog or the mechanism within the Grammy selection and how they go about nomination, it's not just about the best music. There's a lot of strings that I've pulled in regards to who the particular artist belongs to. Mm -hmm. So you have more of a chance of being selected or elected, take your pick, based on a record label, for example, that you are affiliated with. So you could have the best music in the world, but if you're not attached to, say, Sony Records, MCA Records, Universal, EMI, Polydor, 
who or whoever that's out there as a giant record label, it, it means you have your your chances of winning that award is slim and none. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And you know, um, if you've got a name that's a giant name within the industry, mm -hmm. and you have a giant label as well, it gives you a stronger chance of winning that award. All That's right. the way it is. Okay. So we got to recognize all of Easy. It sounds like... So what I'm saying, what I'm saying basically, mm -hmm. what can also happen that you could be a strong named artist with a very, 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 very infinity weak record, but because you're in a major label that can pull a lot of strings with the industry, it still gives you a lot of chance and opportunity to win that particular award. Seen. Straight up. Straight up. Wow. Easy. So, ladies and gentlemen, if you want to be part of this conversation, um, you, you, you have to join, you know, us over here, you know, in case you want to send out any message. Why not? You know, our studio WhatsApp line is 020 000 995 is the WhatsApp line for you to just testing any kind of question and then I'll read them out, you know, to David and he's going to answer. And also we are live on the Asase 995 Facebook page. We are live. If you want to see David, you know, sitting down in his, you know, African attire, you understand me, with his green background <laughs> and all that. Yo, <laughs> you like might, is it? yeah, like man. Is it? yeah, let man. Me, <laughs> like is, let, me, let me point this out. Yeah. You know, Mass Manipulation album was an album that, Within the, the auditorium itself, mm -hmm. I think the auditorium expected still Pulse of One that award. Definitely. Because when the nomination took place, there was five nominees. And when the nomination, when, when all the nominees were called out, by the time it got to Steel Pulse's name, you couldn't hear anybody else. It was like mayhem within the auditorium itself. However, when the time came, as you know, history has it that we never won that. And, you know, I believe that one of the reasons is that, like I said to you, it was due to not, us not being attached to a major label as such. You see oh, what I'm saying? Yeah. Because, like I said, the auditorium was in shock when they saw that we didn't win it. You see what I'm saying? But that was the reason. All right. So and so, so there, there is a lot of moving parts when it comes to winning and having a nomination and being being, you know, all, all to go and walking away with the prize, so to speak. Yeah, all right. So, um, it seems like almost a lot of your albums are, are punchy. You understand me? I'm talking about, you know, the likes of Hansworth, you know, Revolution, Babylon the Bandit, African Holocaust, Mass Manipulation, you know, and, and most of them also make statements to bigger heads and all that. And they surely resonate with the people. I would like to find out from you. Do you think all these things poses challenges for the band? It depends on what kind of challenges you're talking about. I, I do know um, we've been political pawns in certain situations when we've hit certain countries. Um, over the years, for example, uh, one of our first, one of the first time I've recognized that things can become uneasy if we trod the path um, to, to in too much of an in an adversary kind of a way, mm -hmm. is when we did our first performance in a on an island called New Caledonia, which oh. was um, 1993. Mm -hmm. So I'm going back a number of years, and one of the reasons was that we were invited to the, to the island at that time um, based on the island wanting to be independent from France in its totality. Mm -hmm. You know, it's an island out in the South Pacific and we were invited based on the music that we were doing. Mm -hmm. This is what I'm saying. And I saw that a lot of things took place afterwards with us leaving the island um, that made me realize that, you know, we got to be careful, I'll be mindful of what we are about or how we present ourselves musically because it's, you know, we're selected for political reasons that 
can grind against the status quo at given times. Um, I also, you'd mentioned a few of the albums. Uh, I can also remember um, back in the early 80s, there was one or two individuals that actually served jail time in South Africa for performing our songs um, because it was songs that they probably used to help liberate themselves. As you know, at that time, there was the apartheid system in um, South Africa. Mm -hmm. So I I do remember um, coming across individuals who sort of um, made it known to us that they had served jail, jail time for performing our songs. So yes, I do see our songs and our messages um, that become and can become challenging to others in in all kinds of um, dimensions. All right, forty-two minutes going into the art to hear on a Sassy Radio. Um, mass manipulation is a current album released in twenty eighteen. Are you pleased, you know, with how it has done so far? I'm very pleased. It's still going. Um, there's still a lot of those songs yet to be performed live. Mm-hmm. There's still a lot of those songs yet to be released as singles. And there's still a lot of visual um, things left to put towards as far as um, videos. Um, I'm pleased with it. The, the major setback has been COVID because when it actually got released, it was actually 2019 it got released, not 18. But when it got out there, within a year with with us having to tour on the album, as you know, COVID kicked in. So it sort of sort of held the album back to the energy, to the impact it could have had on the world that it deserved to have had. Okay. As you know, COVID sort of restricted a lot of people in everything we did. Mm-hmm. So uh, we're trying to get back on the mend. We're still pushing the album. Well, and although we intend to start putting out, um, start going to the studio and record and do something new, that I still think that um, because we haven't had a chance to tour the world during the release of that album, that we, we still can push it for another couple of years, you know, um, or more. But we want to start start up a new energy soon. So, but oh. yes, I'm pleased with what the message and the feedback we've got from that album. Absolutely. All right. You know, you just um, made mention of covid and you know covid you know step in you know everything came to a halt you know nobody yeah. moved them said nobody move and nobody got hurt you know what i mean yeah. so, <laughs> everything came to a standstill live music you know also came to you know a halt you understand me everything everything yeah. matter of fact everything was standstill you understand me now yeah we have you know overcome that and everything is okay now and all that. How is your current touring, you know, reign? The current touring, like I said, we've been, we've, our last t- tour has been in Europe. Mm-hmm. And we haven't toured Europe for quite some time, even before COVID. Mm-hmm. America has been usually our stamping ground with the odd shows within South America itself. So this time around, We've penetrated um, South America, i.e. Brazil, places like Chile and all those kind of places. And then we normally do our run of the United States. And then we decide to do a longer tour of Europe, Mm -hmm. mainly festivals. And this time around, we hit uh, quite a number of new countries that we've never um, penetrated before, like Slovenia and Slovakia. And we intend to... um, keep hitting new territories or territories that we haven't done for many years. So um, that's the intention. That's the plan. That's our dreams right now. All right. So um, on your Facebook page, I I read a notice that, you know, you've held your U.S. tour um, September 13th through to September, you know, 27th. What Mm -hmm. exactly you know, um, um, kind of informed that for you to put on hold, you know, your toe over there? Mm. Well, it's a combination of things. Mm-hmm. You know, as you know, when we tour, we have to go through um, visa processing. Mm-hmm. And this time around, it's taking longer than normal. But also, um, 
there's a, they also had an injury as well, to be fair. You know, so along with that, we just thought it was best to just hold off and just um, come back around again. So until those things are sorted, then we're in again. Wow. Easy. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, so on my Facebook page now, all right, um, Eswabat says, King, ask our brother David, what is his view about reparation after a couple of visits to Ghana, Africa as a whole? Reparation? Yes. When you say reparation, let's be clear on it. Are we talking about compensation for the slave trade and colonialism <laughs> or what? I am sure. <laughs> well, reparation, there's a lot of, I've got a different spin on reparation because, it, it, you know, it's really talking about compensation, but to what degree? Um, as you could see, there's a situation going on in places like Niger mm -hmm. and, um, say, Mali and even most recently Gabon, where, mm -hmm. you know, the people are taking over their country. When I say the people, I mean... The indigenous people, of course. the working class, or mm -hmm. what have you, are taking over the administration, one for a better phrase. Mm -hmm. And um, we know Africa has a negative legacy of, of having a lot of minerals, having a lot of resources, wealth that has been, fine, that has been energizing the world, mm -hmm. is what I'm saying. Whether it's gold, whether it's oil, whether it's diamonds, whether it's platinum, whether it's um, Fulton, which is used for um, the mobile phones. Africa has been there using minerals and their natural resources to energize the world. So my thing is the world still have their hand or their hands in the cookie jar or the pots mm -hmm. of Africa. And when you say reparation and compensation does it mean all right we get a trillion dollars for what took place for slavery and colonialism mm -hmm. and the hand is still in the key minerals the key resources and then within 10 years 20 30 years that compensation is all gone or would i prefer to say all right those who have got their hands and all their the grip on all the resources that Africa have, let it go forever. I prefer that more as reparation than being handed a set of money that's going to disappear over time, or we don't know who the money goes to. I prefer to know that Africa is um, alleviated from all the hands from Western world civilization and what have you mm -hmm. over 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 the past couple of hundred years now if you if you want to um, go back into the eighteen hundreds when it all started mm -hmm. this is what I'm saying. All right. And um where Africa can now govern itself with the resources that is naturally theirs. That's what I would prefer if it comes to reparation. Where it's all right, you got your hands in, you got the copper. Mm -hmm. In Zambia, mm -hmm. you got the gold in Ghana, you got the diamonds in South Africa, mm -hmm. you got this and that from there. So let them go and let the people start having a level playing field with what to do with their own resources. That's what reparation means to me. Not, right. the, not the money that's going to be given back to the people that the people already have because of the resources that was that was um, looted from in the first place, this is what I'm saying. So in other words, take Ghana, for example. Ghana's given back um, a million dollars. Yeah. But it's the same million dollars that came from the gold Ghana had in the first place. <laughs> I'm saying now, nah, I'm saying, keep what you got and let us keep what we have. Mm -hmm. And start again and let us do it right. All right. That's what reparations really mean to me. All right. You understand? In terms of, um, you, 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 you've visited Africa a few times and all that. But in yeah. terms of repatriation now, in terms of repatriation now, when is the I, you know, coming home? <laughs> Easy. All right. That's a, that's, a, that's a very good question because 
here where it becomes difficult with me. I mean, I mean, I love Ghana. Every time I go to Ghana, I'm not in a hurry to, to leave. Put it that way. And you are talking to Ghana now. <laughs> I'm talking to Ghana. So when I'm here, when I'm there, <laughs> I'm not in a hurry to leave. But, you know, um, because of my commitments in other parts of the world, you know, like touring and recording and family commitments and what have you, you know, other types of businesses, you know, I, we, I have to leave. Now, the thing is now, I'm a touring act. And I've hit in a lot of other countries within Africa itself. And although I would like to know, I would, my dream is to know that I can have a footings in as much African countries as I can. So I'd like to know I can set myself up somewhere in Ghana, but I'd like to know I can set myself up in Kenya too, Ethiopia if I want to, you know, Senegal if I'd like to as well, and um, Ivory Coast if I wish. The problem I have is that I've not persevered all the countries to make a solid decision. However, I do intend to know that I've got something going on in Ghana at some stage. But that's that's where I'm at right now. I'm okay. still indecisive. <laughs> You're... But repatriation is a must. Definitely, definitely. Please. Repatriation is a must. You understand me? Okay, so um, uh, Sean Price says, Lagazi, tell Steel Post. To just big up my name, Ganja Bible. You understand me? He, he All said, right. <laughs> he said, I, you know, um, reminisce years back, I had to get off a taxi because I heard um, Rally Round being played in a spot. It was my first time hearing the song. And honestly, it caught me, you know, that day. I had to, um, so I had to wait for the next taxi. Those days, technology wasn't common like these days. Please, tell him to just big up the name Ganja Bible. <laughs> All right, Ganja Bible, you're big. That's the processor. Easy. <laughs> so, Ganja Bible is representing from the old lady ghettos. He said, the fire is burning over their heart this afternoon. <laughs> All right. That's here. Yeah, so... um. I would like to find out now, you know, in, in a sound system culture arena, you know, I own a sound system in Ghana by name Lagazi Sound International. And matter of fact, I don't even have a jingle from Steel Post. I don't even have the voice of David Hines saying, yeah, big up Lagazi Sound International. I don't even have one dot plate from Steel Post, but everything good. Always, I talk to Skelly. I'm like, yo, Skelly, you know, talk to David, man. You know, t tell, you know tell David to bless me up with a thing. You know what I mean? I have listened to a lot of, I have listened to a lot of sound clash and all that. It is only one, one sound, especially the sounds from UK that normally plays steel pose. And I know that anytime they play steel pose too, the forward is big. You know, why are you not open for dubs? Because I don't hear, yes, man. You know, I I I, I don't hear the I'm, big sound system like the Jaros, the Stone Loves, and all that kind of thing. I don't know whether I'm not uh, like I I don't follow yeah. them too much for me to hear them. But um, yeah, I, I I think that's the case. I mean, Article Sound came back to me. Article Sound comes from out of France, Paris, mm -hmm. and every now and again, a sound system would send me a video of them. Winning a clash based on a steel pulse dub. Yes. An article sent me something where you know where he won his clash based on a steel pulse dub. Yes, there are few and far between, but they're they're out there. I mean, even one of the best sound system the world has ever experienced, uh, Mighty Crown, yeah, has a steel pulse dub. Yeah. So you know, um, they're out there. Kilimanjaro sound, yeah. you, you you name them, they're out there. They have steel pulse dubs. They're out there. So, kill I, I, them, crew. You near me? There's so many of them. Yeah, that have them. Yeah, trust me. All right. So, so, so <laughs> there could be more. There could. Yeah, yeah. So, I would yeah, like yeah. to find out. Um, how how do we get to you if if we want a dub plate? Well, you got Skelly now, <laughs> <laughs> and Skelly Skelly mean business. <laughs> Easy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but all right. Let me find out from you. Skelly is one of the hardworking, you know, Ghanaian youths 
out there making Ghana proud out there. You working with Skelly now, you know, how is it like? I would like to hear it from you. All right. Um, <clears throat> the first, if I think of Skelly, mm -hmm. the word that comes to me immediately is, is discipline. Mm -hmm. Dis disciplinarian. Yeah. That's what comes to mind when I think of Skelly. He's very disciplined. He's very conscious mm -hmm. as far as his trade, his, prof his profession. Um, and he's relentless in whatever he participates in. Um, he he's a good person to have if you've got a business running and you want it to have it run, you know, maximum and, and to be run. Mm -hmm. You know, with a with a proper frame of mind to in order to have continual success. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying. So um, you know, I'm it's a to me I find it's a blessing to have scale in the midst. Right. Because uh, it's something I think Steel Pulse needed all these years that I don't think we've ever had. You know, it's always a fly by night approach to what we've had of people who start with earnest and start with a, a high level of energy. But after a while, the energy wanes for all kinds of reasons, for, you know, um, they're for their own self-motivation and self-interest, mm -hmm. where skill is, you know, has been within my presence now for some going on three years, come to think of it. And his energy level has not waned. Mm -hmm. So this is why I say the word disciplinarian comes to mind when I think of skilling. All right. Seriously? And loyalty. And yeah. loyalty. All right. Seriously, yeah. I have a lot of questions on, 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 on our Facebook and all that, but we have two minutes to wrap up. I think I need two hours to do this. So I know this is not going to be the last time we're going to talk to Steel Post. You know, I think we need to reschedule. No, the last time for now. <laughs> <laughs> the last time for now. <laughs> <laughs> definitely, definitely. So we need to reschedule again and come forward again. But in wrapping up, what message do you have for the whole of Ghana and Africa as a whole? Well, Africa as a whole, you know, I always remember that when Steel Pulse formulated as a band, Almost 50 years ago, I mean, this is our 47th year since we uh, formulated as a band, that when we got together as a band, it was about having Africa in mind. It was about thinking of the diaspora and about thinking of um, where we originally came from as a, as a, as a people, if is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. And for the Ghanaians out there, we know that you know, Jamaicans on the whole, the, the lion's share of Jamaicans as a populace, you know, you know, we are descendants from Ghanaian people for the most part. And knowing that Ghana has embraced Steel Pulse to the extent that you have done um, is joy to our souls and to our hearts. And we know Ghana's always had us in your hearts and we feel honored to know that after all these years, Ghana still have maximum respect for the band and honor the band in the way you all do. Especially, I mean, what took place prior to COVID when we got invited to your independence shows us that, you know, um, we know that we are unprecedented when it comes to um, your respect for us. Right. Thank you. Thank you, David Hans, for your time and space. Yes. I'll I would like to say big respect to also um, Skelly for setting up this coffee robot all the way from the UK. Give thanks and to the producers, technicians. I would like to say thank you so much. Achu is here with a spouse. And trust me, this interview, we must go back to it once again. And we'll come back to David in no time. My name is King Lagazi. We'll be here next week between the hours of 12 to 3. Easy. Love. <laughs>